Before we get started, though, I want to play a little game, okay? Because the youth, they always have all these fun games, right? So I want to play a little game, a little icebreaker, before we get started, okay? So this is how the game is going to work. Let's say I came up to you after service, and I said, I want to take you to lunch. But you have to decide between Chick-fil-A and Whataburger, Chick -fil I know this is controversial because everyone that's from Texas loves Whataburger. And that's because Whataburger's only found in Texas as of right now, right? But let's say I came up to you and I said, you have to go to Chick-fil-A or Whataburger. Do you have it in your head which one you'd like to choose, all right? Everybody put their hand up. If you can put your hand up, put your hand up. All right, come on, let's play along. Okay, if you would choose to go to Chick-fil-A, I want you to keep your hand up. Everybody else, put your hand down. All right, so now all of you guys have decided to go to Chick-fil-A. Now when we get there, I say, okay, you can have a Chick-fil-A original sandwich or you can have a spicy chicken sandwich, okay? If you would choose to have a spicy chicken sandwich, I want you to keep your hand up. Whew, all right, you guys are my people right here. All right, so now we get to the front, and they say, hey, I'm really sorry, we're out of all the sauces, so you can either have ketchup or Chick-fil-A sauce, okay? You can only choose ketchup or Chick-fil-A sauce. Everyone that would choose Chick-fil-A sauce, I want you to put your hand down. Okay, so who, who's all left? Okay, we got a few people, okay? So now you guys are my folks that would have went to Chick-fil-A, that would have chosen a spicy chicken sandwich and chose to have ketchup. It looks like there's only three of you guys, and you guys are my people, okay? Now this is the final question. This is a big one, okay? They say you can have Coke or Dr. Pepper. Ooh, okay. I just found out why everyone in Texas loves Dr. Pepper, because apparently it was started in Waco, so everybody here loves Dr. Pepper, and I've lived in several parts of the United States, and nobody likes Dr. Pepper like Texans, all right? So if you have to choose Dr. Pepper or Coke, and if you would choose a Coke, I want you to keep your hand up. Ooh, all three of you. All right, all four of you. All right, so now it's my turn. I'm gonna make a decision, and did you have your hand up? All right, I'm gonna choose you. Here you go, here's a Chick-fil-A card. Enjoy. Your spicy chicken sandwich with ketchup and a Coke. Now that was just a fun icebreaker game, but the thing I want you to start thinking about is decisions, right? Making decisions. How many decisions do you think that we make every single day? A lot, right? Well, the average person makes 35,000 decisions a day. 35,000 decisions a day. And if you consider that we sleep roughly six hours a night. That means we make almost 2,000 decisions an hour or one to two decisions a second. Think about that. I mean, think about this morning, right? Everything that you had to do. I had to decide what time I was gonna get up. I had to decide, like when I got out of bed, if I was gonna have Fruit Loops with marshmallows or Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Okay, that was a struggle. I had to choose what I was gonna read in the Bible for my devo devotion. I had to choose when I went to the gym which body part I was gonna work out. When I got back, I had to choose if I was gonna take a shower or just walk out smelling bad. I had to choose what I was gonna wear. And those are just the decisions I had to make before I even got my day started. And that doesn't even include all the little micro decisions in between. And let's be honest, the hardest decision I had to make this morning was between Fruit Loops and Cinnamon Toast Crunch. So I love them both, and my wife knows to keep it stocked. I got, a good, I got a good woman at home. Now, what I'm saying here is I don't think we need to actually stress out over every single decision that we make because most decisions aren't important in the grand scheme of things. Most decisions aren't important in the grand scheme of things, but every single day, we are faced with decisions that are important. Every single day, we have decisions in our lives that we have to make that are important. And isn't it frustrating when you have to make a decision, oftentimes it's between what is easy and what is right, right? We have to choose between what is easy or what is right. They happen to be on the opposite side of our decision making. We have to choose between what is easy and wrong 
The easy thing is oftentimes the wrong thing to do and what is the right thing but the hard thing to do. And those two are on the opposite ends of our decision. Now every single day, we have decisive moments in our lives and I've talked about this before, but a decisive moment is when we have to make a decision and that decision is gonna dictate the next set of choices we have in our lives. So if you come to a fork in the road and you make a left, you're never gonna see what was down on the right side, right? And if you come to a decision and you choose to do the easy path, if you choose to take a shortcut, you're never gonna see the options that were available to you on the other side, amen? Does that make sense? And if you choose to do those things that are easy and you continue to do, to do those things that are easy, you're never gonna see God's blessing because God doesn't bless disobedience. That's something I say all the time. God doesn't bless disobedience. And as humans, we're at a little bit of a disadvantage, to be honest, because there's a thing called the law of least effort, which says that humans will naturally choose to do the easiest thing. And oftentimes, the easiest thing is the wrong decision, right? So we can choose to do the easy but wrong thing or the hard but right thing. I mean, it makes sense, right? Because if the easy thing was the right thing to do and the wrong thing or the, the right thing was the hard thing to do, it wouldn't really be a decision now, would it? We would choose to do the easy thing because it's the right thing to do. But listen closely. I wish I would have put this as a point. I didn't, but listen closely. The path to becoming the person God created you to be is followed by making a lot of hard choices, right? Because we have to choose between our pleasure sometimes and what God wants us to do, between our flesh and what the Lord wants us to do. And no matter who you are or where you are, none of us are there yet. We're all continuing on this path until we meet Jesus Christ in heaven. And if you wanna become the person that God called you to be, it's gonna, be, it's gonna take making the right choices, the tough choices over the easy choices, over the shortcuts on a consistent basis. And that's important. Because everybody knows if you go to the gym, once a month you're not gonna get ripped. You don't go to the gym once a month and be healthy. It takes a cons doing things on a consistent basis. That means you don't just need to make the decision, a right decision once, you need to make it again and again and again. So the story I wanna talk to you guys about tonight is a story where the main characters have to choose between what is easy and what is right. So a quick backstory, the Israelites, God's chosen people, were taken captive by Babylon. And what Babylon would do is they would go in and they would invade a country and they would defeat it. And what they would do is they'd take the best of the best back with them to Babylon. And they would indoctrinate them in the ways of the Babylonian culture. I mean, they would take the smartest, the brightest, basically picture Pastor Steve. That's the type of person they would take, right? They would take the best of the best. They would indoctrinate them. And their thought process was this. When they took the best of the best from every single culture, Babylon would be stronger than ever. And what they would do is then they would put them in leadership. And that's where we find ourselves right now in Daniel chapter three. And at this point, we have three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who have been taken captive, and they've been captive for over 10 years, for over a decade, and they're now in their mid-30s. So basically what I'm saying is they have some clout. They have some influence. They're not as high in the totem pole as they could possibly be, but they definitely have some influence. They definitely have some substance to their lives. They, they have probably nice homes. They have nice clothing. They're able to eat good food. They have something to lose. They definitely have something to lose. And they find themselves with making a decision between what is easy and what is right. And how many of you guys know it's harder to make a decision when you have something to lose? And these guys definitely had something to lose. So verses one through three, and I put all the scriptures on here for you. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue 90 foot tall and nine foot wide, and he set it up in Babylon. Then he sent messengers out to gather the high officers, the officials, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, the officials, to come to a dedication for the statue. So right off the bat, it sounds like King Nebuchadnezzar has a huge 
ego, right? Like this guy has a pride problem. He invites over a bunch of people to check out this statue and he doesn't invite over a bunch of nobodies, right? He's invite o- inviting over a bunch of somebodies, the high officers, the officials, the governors, the advisors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates. This is like a red carpet of the who's who, right? The most influential, most powerful people. I mean, just imagine if I came up to you after service and I said, hey, I made this golden statue. It's like 90 foot tall and it's in my backyard. You wanna come over to my house for a party? Like, you'd be like, uh, you're weird. Like, that's a little weird, right? But that's essentially what King Nebuchadnezzar did. And then in verse four through six, it says, then the herald shouted, people of all races, nations, and languages, listen to the Lord's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all the other musical instruments, you must bow down and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. And if you refuse, you'll be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. Does anyone even know what a zither is? Because like, I'm reading this and I'm trying to figure out even what a zither is. Like, I'm not sure. But basically, when the music starts, everyone has to bow down. And not only does everybody have to bow down, Now, if everyone doesn't bow down, they're gonna be put to death. So he invites a bunch of people over and then he threatens them with death. So this guy has a really, really big ego. And for most of us, I would probably say 99% of you in this this, uh, sanctuary today, we all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We probably all heard it hundreds of times. Maybe even thousands of times we've heard this story. But the Lord has really been convicting me. The Holy Spirit has really been convicting me because there's so many stories in this word that we've heard them so many times that we just kind of like skim over them, right? Because we've heard it, so we just kind of blast through it. But there's some real hidden gems. So the Holy Spirit has really been convicting me to dig a little bit deeper into these passages, right? Because I've read this hundreds of times, but this time I just let the Holy Spirit speak to me And I came up with a few ideas, and I want you to just, you know, if you're checked down, I want you to really get back in, because I'm gonna look at this in a little bit different perspective than we normally do. And the first thing I I saw as I was reading this is I kind of often picture this as like a one-time event, right? Everybody comes, the music plays, and they all bow down. But in the original language, it could be interpreted whenever the music plays. People need to bow down. So... Whenever the music started, whatever the people were doing, the people had to bow down. Whenever King Nebuchadnezzar said, DJ, hit that music, everyone had to bow down. Drop whatever they're doing and bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar. It's like he's saying, look, I know you guys have a lot of power, but I'm the one who's really in charge here. He's trying to flex on them. He's trying to show them who is really in charge, and it's not them. So in verses seven through 12, It says this, so at the sound of the music, all the people of all the nations and the languages, they bowed down and worshiped. But some astrologers went and informed on the Jews. So what I'm picturing here is the astrologers were probably jealous of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because these guys aren't even Babylonians and they're in positions of power. So they go and they tattle. They say, King Nebuchadnezzar, these three, they're not bowing down. So King Nebuchadnezzar, um, let me see where am I here. So, but the Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were put in charge of the province of Babylon, like they remind him, like, look, you put them in charge of this province in Babylon. They paid no attention to you, majesty. They refused to serve your God and not worship your golden statue you set up. So, in reality, this is what's weird to me. In reality, right, like they kind of just blow past this whole idea of them making this decision. They don't even talk about the idea of them making this decision. And it's interesting to me because the decision they had to make here must have been very tough, right? Like this is life or death, but this passage basically just blows right by it. And I wish I could be a fly in the wall, like having Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be there. They're like, well, Shadrach and Meshach, like they told us we need to bow down. Are you gonna do it? Are you gonna do it? Asking each other. And I think, think about it, like the inner struggle in their mind. It must have been very real, right? Because most of us, when we read this scripture, we just jump to the very end. We just jump right past this section of them making this decision. But the inner struggle 
must have been real because these guys had a lot to lose by not bowing down, right? Think about the inner debate they must have been having. I mean, we've all been there, right? Like, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? Should I listen to the Lord or should I take this shortcut? We've all had that inner struggle. And just picture, they're thinking to themselves, man, I'm supposed to bow down, but I can't do that because it's against God's word. But if I don't bow down, they're gonna kill me. And if they kill me, how can I glorify God when I'm dead? Right, because we always try to justify ourselves when we're doing something against what God has called us to do. So that inner struggle must have been real. And honestly, like, I struggled this morning choosing Fruit Loops and Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and the struggle was real. And these guys are choosing a, a, a decision between life and death. They had to choose between the right but hard thing or the easy but wrong thing. I mean, think about the last time God has called you to do something and that inner struggle that went through your head. Because every time I've read this before, I kind of just were like, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't bow down, right? Like, of course they didn't bow down. It's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's kind of like LeBron James or Michael Jordan hitting a buzzer beater shot at the end of a basketball game. It's like, of course they hit the winning shot. It's like Michael Jordan, like, no duh. But that doesn't even put into perspective, not even close to put into perspective that the pressure that these three men must have been under to choose the right but difficult thing. Now, hopefully in your life, you don't know anybody that would build a 90 foot statue and invite you over to bow down to it. So you're not gonna be faced with that temptation or that struggle, right? But all of us are constantly faced with things in our lives, every single day, every single week, every single month, choosing between the easy but wrong thing or the hard but right thing. Which one do we choose? We're all faced with those things, right? I had a rough day at work. It was a, a long, tiring, exhausting day. So when I come home, I can either play with my, my kids, spend time with my spouse, or I can just shut them out, choosing the godly thing or choosing the easy thing. Somebody cuts me off. I can either curse them out or I can pray for them. I can either choose to, to use drugs. I can choose to drink. I can choose to watch pornography. We can always choose the easy thing. The easy thing is always gonna be right in front of our face, right? And the list could go on and on and the list never goes away. The list just simply changes as you get older. The easy thing is to continue to live in sin when you know about it than to take action to get out of it. The easy thing is to blame somebody else instead of take responsibility. The easy thing is to keep a secret instead of coming clean. The easy thing is always gonna be right in front of our faces. So will you choose the easy path or will you choose the difficult path? But I want you to listen, this is important. The choices that you make, the choices that you make every day will largely dictate the type of person that you're gonna become. The choices that you make, the decisions that you make, do I decide to follow God or do I decide to take a shortcut? They're gonna largely dictate the person that you become. And the road to becoming the person that God wants you to become is never gonna happen by constantly taking the easy path. If you constantly take the easy path, you're gonna end up like somebody you don't even recognize. You're gonna look in the mirror and not even recognize yourself. So we move on to verses 13 through 15. It says this, King Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage and he ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought before him. And he said, is it true that you refuse to serve my God and worship the golden statue I've set up before you? I'll give you one more chance I'll give you one more chance when the music plays to bow down, but if you refuse, you'll be immediately thrown into the blazing furnace. <laughs> then he says this. I, this is like, I don't get why he says this, but he says, and then what God will be able to rescue you from my power. Like, <laughs> it's like he's egging on God or something, right? Like, why did he have to say that? It's like God is in heaven, he's like, ooh, I'm afraid of King Nebuchadnezzar. No, God in heaven's like, this God right here, I can save them. But King Nebuchadnezzar here, he's saying, here you go. You still have a choice to choose the easy thing. 
And isn't that the way the enemy works, right? Like you've, you've been praying, Lord, give me strength to make this decision, to follow you, to do what you want me to do. And you make that decision and you say, praise the Lord, thank you for giving me strength. Whew, I'm glad that's over with. Only to find yourself the next day, the next week, the next month, having to make that exact same decision again. And King Nebuchadnezzar's like, look, I know you made your choice, but consequences are coming. So you still have a chance to get off the ramp to easy street. I'm still going to give you that chance. And their answer, I love their answer. It's like one of my favorite answers because these are some 35-year-old men standing in front of the most powerful person in the world. And I love their answer. They say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves. If you throw us into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve will be able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear, your majesty, that we will never serve your God or worship the golden statue you have set up. You see, they respect his position, right? Because they call him your majesty. They respect his position, but they don't respect the king because he's not the king of kings. They understand the hierarchy, right? God puts people and above us in places of position and authority, but when what man says interferes with what God says, we're called to listen to God, not man. So they respect his authority, but they don't respect the king. And King Nebuchadnezzar was so furious that his face became distorted. Then he commanded that the furnace be turned up seven times hotter, that the strongest men come and bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they throw them into this blazing furnace. I don't know about you, but I've, my brother and my sister used to get in fights all the time. And when my brother's face would start looking crazy, like that crazy look, I'm like, Christine, you need to back off because Stephen's about to go crazy. His face got distorted. He's like, he's super mad at this point. And at this point, I want to take a little bit, a side route. Because usually we, we only look at this story through the eyes of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But I want to look at this for a second in the, in the perspective of King Nebuchadnezzar right? King Nebuchadnezzar was so powerful. And I don't think that we can understand how powerful he really is, right? Because even the most powerful person in the United States, the president, has people that say no to him every single day. I'm sure you guys watch the news, right? But nobody ever says no to King Nebuchadnezzar. Never. I mean, what kind of person would you be if no one ever said no to you, if you were surrounded by yes men and yes women, they're like, yep, yep, good job, yes, 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 yes. What kind of person would you become? I mean, we see this all the time with celebrities, right? They, they surround themselves by yes people and then their lives fall apart. I mean, think about it, it would be scary with no checks and no balances in our lives and that's exactly where King Nebuchadnezzar finds himself. Nobody ever says no to him, and he's the king over the whole known world. And he's a competent king because everywhere he goes, he wins. So not only is he competent, he's also confident. He's the kind of guy who wins, he's rich, he's powerful, he's smart, he's savvy. When he looks around for people on his level, he sees no one. He's looking down at everybody. And I'm sure... Some of you may be thinking like, well, I could handle it, but who knows what your heart would do with all of that power, right? We see how it affects King Nebuchadnezzar. He has a bit of a pride issue, right? We can see that, and we can also see that he has a bit of an anger issue. And if I can just make an, a simple observation, it seems that pride and anger are connected, if you have a pride problem, usually you have an anger problem. And if you have an anger problem on the outside, maybe it's because you have a pride problem on the inside. It's just a simple observation from the scripture. And another observation is this. King Nebuchadnezzar's command were like total overkill, right? Like he says, turn the fire up seven times hotter. Like regular fire would have been fine. And in fact, like many scholars say, if he really wanted to torture them or punish them, they would turn it down seven times because it's the difference between instant death and like slow cooking, right? And then he says, get the strongest men and bind up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys weren't warriors, okay? These guys had like office jobs. Like regular guards would have been enough, right? So why did he do that? Why did he do it? The simple answer, he was mad. He was mad. If you just wanna go with the simple answer, that's, that's it right there. 
But how about we like dig a little bit deeper? What if it could be, what if it could be that he was actually nervous? That he was actually nervous. Because remember, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, our God can save us, our God will save us, and even if he doesn't save us, we're still not gonna bow down. And remember, nobody ever says no to King Nebuchadnezzar. And then on top of that, King Nebuchadnezzar had a run-in with the God of Israel before through Daniel, right? He's seen God in action. So maybe in his head he's doing the math. What God has done in the past Plus, these three men who have this confidence for the God of Israel equals my demise, equals disaster for King Nebuchadnezzar. So what does he do? He says, turn the fire up seven times hotter so that way your God won't even have a chance to save them. And again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't even like fight. They don't even put up a fight. They just go along with it. But I think there's something else we can learn from this. And it's this. The people in our lives that tend to be the loudest about not believing in God, the people in our lives that seem to be the most angry when it comes to the Lord, who fight against the Lord the most, we tend to think of those people as being the ones that are furthest from God, right? But what if that's not the case? I mean, I hate to spoil the end of the story, but in like 10 minutes, King Nebuchadnezzar is gonna have a coming to Jesus moment. So what if the people in our lives who we think are the furthest from God aren't as far away as we think? What if it's by you making one decision to do the right but hard thing that's gonna tip the scales for their hearts to be softened to come to know the Lord? What if? And it goes on, Verses 21 through 25, it says this. So they tied them up and they threw them in the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, their turbans, their robes, and all their other garments. And then skipping down to verse 24, it says, Did, King Nebuchadnezzar says, didn't we tie up three men and throw them in the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did. And King Nebuchadnezzar replied, look, there's four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. And of course, that fourth person Many people believe to be the incarnate Christ, Christ before he came down in flesh. And going on to verse 26, then he came closer to the door. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God. 10 minutes ago, he was saying, what God can save you from me? Now he's saying, servants of the most high God. Like what a change, what a change. And then they came out of the fire and not a hair on their head was singed, their clothes were not scorched, and they didn't even smell like smoke. I mean, I walk past a bonfire, and I smell like smoke. These people were walking in a bonfire, and they didn't even smell like smoke. So the point behind my message is this. We need to choose the right but hard decisions, but we need to also realize that when we choose the right but hard decisions, it may feel like we're being thrown into fire. And I have three points that I wanna talk about, about fire really quickly. And the first one is, is this. Fire in your life does not mean you're going the wrong direction. Fire in your life does not mean you're going the wrong direction. And this story, it clearly shows us that these three men made the right decision and they still ended up in fire. And remember, fire can purify us. So stop using difficult circumstances in your life as a compass because it's not always a good compass. If you avoid every fire in your life, you're never gonna end up where God wants you to be. So whatever fire you're facing right now, whatever difficulty you're facing right now, don't let it detour you from God's plan. Sometimes we have to walk through the flames, wipe off the sweat, and keep going. And remember who's walking right next, with, right next to us, right? We have Christ there right with us, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had Christ in the center of the fire with them. The second thing is this, sometimes God uses fire to free us. Sometimes God uses fire to free us. One of the coolest things about the story is, right, they come out and nothing is burnt, not as, their hair isn't singed, they don't smell like smoke. The only thing that's gone is the ropes that were binding them. The ropes had burned off. And sometimes use, God uses fire in our lives to destroy the things that are holding us back. 
You know, when I, go, when I cook, we use cast iron pans at my house. If I would pick up that pan after I get done cooking it with it and I lifted it up, I would drop it. You know why? Because it's hurting me. And sometimes God uses a fire in our lives to help us let go of things that are holding us back from fulfilling his plan. As strange as it may sound, pain can be a purifier. And suffering causes us to let go and not hold on. And finally, the third point is this. The fire was a test. The fire was a test. In verse 30, it says, King, Neb- King Nebuchadnezzar promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to an even, even higher position in Babylon. On the other side of the fire was promotion. On the other side of the fire was greater influence. They were able to reach more people. Again, I'll say this again. God doesn't bless disobedience. If you're not being promoted, maybe it's because you're being disobedient. That's why the choices that we make are so important. The test was to test their character, right? Because our character has to match our calling. Because if we reach our calling and our character doesn't match it, we're gonna fall. You find out something about yourself when you're faced with a fire. You find out something about yourself when you're faced with the crisis. And it's important to point, that, point out that this is not God testing them because God is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He already knows what they're gonna choose, right? And just because God knows what we're gonna choose doesn't mean he forces us to choose it because we have free will. But he's the author of the book. This test was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to help them deepen their faith in God. How many of you guys, after you've gone through a fire and walked with God, you're stronger afterwards? You have Godfidence, G-O-D, Godfidence afterwards because you made it through the fire and God was with you the whole time. It was testing their character because on the other side was promotion and their character had to match their calling. Amen? Three really quick things about who you hang out with. First one is this, there's real strength in real friendships. There's real strength in real friendships. The number two thing is this. It's important to stand with other people who share the same conviction. It's important to stand with people who share the same conviction. The third thing is this. Um, Find friends who will stand with you in the test of hardship, success, wealth, and possible death, and value those friendships because they're hard to find. You see, It's hard to say what would happen if only one of them were up there, right? If just Shadrach was up there by himself, it's hard to say. Maybe he would have bowed down. At least, at the very least, the likelihood of him bowing down would have been greater, right? And if all three of them were up there and one of them decided to bow down, the likelihood of the other two bowing down would have increased as well, right? But the Bible teaches, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You are who you hang out with. And even as adults, I think we need to understand that. It's something we may teach children, but it doesn't mean it's something that can't, doesn't apply to our lives as well. Amen. Worship team, if you guys could come up, perfect. I really wanna challenge you with this message. Okay, and this is a message that you've, you've heard about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego so many times, so I hope that you didn't just check out because you know the end of the story. But there's a lot we can learn from this message. The fact is, when we see somebody in our lives who's fighting against God, that doesn't mean they're as far away from God as we might think. It might just be one tough choice to serve God on our behalf for them to come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Amen? Secondly, Sometimes we have to walk through fire, but we're never walking through it alone, right? God is always there with us. And at least in this case, at least in this case, on the other side of the fire was promotion, right? God blessed them being obedient. And also they weren't obedient just once, they were obedient again. I want you to see the value in making the right decision even when it's hard over making the easy decision or taking a shortcut because the longest distance between one point and another point is a shortcut. I mean, I'm a guy, I can admit this. I tell my wife, hey, I'm gonna take a shortcut. I know this shortcut and it ends up taking us 20 minutes longer every time (laughs) because I don't really know the shortcut like I thought I did. 
Phil? I know you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like these three, sometimes when you make the right decision, you'll be misunderstood. Sometimes you'll be screamed at, and sometimes you'll be placed in a fire. However, if you let the fire purify you, you'll be a powerful instrument in the hands of the Lord. I want you to know it doesn't matter what you've done in your past. It doesn't matter if you made a whole bunch of wrong decisions, if you took shortcuts your whole life up until this point. It's not too late to stop taking shortcuts right now. From this moment forward, you can decide and say to yourself, I'm gonna start doing what God wants me to do, even if it's difficult. And maybe you've been in here and you've, <laughs> you're 18 or 80 and you've been making the right decisions your whole life. Don't get lazy. It's easy when we've, you know, been Christians for a long time to just grow complacent. It doesn't matter where you are when you walk with the Lord. We always need to be vi uh, vigilant because the devil is coming to kill, steal, and destroy you. And when you start taking it easy, it's easy to start taking shortcuts. Amen. If everyone could please stand. Every day, we're faced with making thousands of decisions. And like I said, not all of them are important, but I guarantee every single day, there's a decision in your life that you're making to either serve God or to not serve Him, to obey Him or to not obey Him. Choose wisely, live intentionally, amen? In a second, the altars are gonna be open. I just want you to take some time. Maybe you're having a difficult time making decisions, making the right decisions. Instead, you're taking shortcuts and you want God to give you that strength. I want you to come to the front and pray. Maybe God spoke to you through this message in a completely different way. Whatever it is, I wanna urge you to understand the importance of spending time alone with God, building that relationship with God because if you don't have a relationship with God when you're about to face the fire, it's gonna be really hard for you to make the right decision. And one of the best ways to build and strengthen your relationship with God is through prayer, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord God, I praise you and I thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that this word would sink deeply into our hearts, Lord God. And when we're faced with making a decision, Lord God, we would choose to follow you. Even if it may be difficult, even if it may seem like the consequences are overwhelming, Lord God, I pray that you would give us the strength, Lord God, to choose the right but hard thing over the easy but wrong thing. Lord God, and for those who are here, Lord God, that have been making the right decision their whole life, I pray that you'd give them strength to continue to make that decision every single day, to continue to take one step forward for you, Lord Jesus. Lord God, we love you and we praise you. Lord God, speak to our hearts in this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I have